Hey guys, thank you to everyone who's joining this Eternal 12 film podcast. I have two fast friends and incredible creatives with me, Nick and Tara. How are you guys doing? Good, thank you, Stuart. Good to see you. Nice. Yeah, good to see you too. And um, I really want to dive into it and just really the intention of this episode was to go deeper into uh, the screenwriting, into writing novels and stuff as well. And, um, you know, really to hit the ground running with your background and like you come from institutions of amazing uh, parents who are incredible actresses, painters, artists. So I guess starting with ladies first with, with Tara as well. You know, obviously I loved, you know, when, when we first met talking about, uh, some of your, your sort of, um, your scripts and stuff that you'd worked on and where you are today. So diving into that, how did how that happen from say childhood into your twenties, getting, knowing that you were meant to be a writer on this earth? How did that happen? Um, I think that I was sort of, uh, I found it difficult to acknowledge my gift for a long time and to honor it. Um, I can't, I come from a lineage of very successful people and I think it's hard to carve out your own identity in some senses, although I'm not going to play a tiny violin here. Um, it, um, took me a while to honor, um, my true passions. And I started out really as a poet and everybody said, you Back can't, your teens. yeah. And everybody your said, teens. you can't, cool. that's not a career. That's not. So then I went into uh, film and TV and um, as a presenter, as a radio presenter, um, and uh, in front and behind the camera, developed my own uh, contents company, um, and sort of came round and back to the writing, having been sort of everywhere else. Nick and I also share um, a music past. Both of us were in the music industry um, for That's some years. That. And it was a big passion for both of us. Uh, but then we both sort of came back to writing as a as a first port of call, as it were. So sort of went around the houses and came home. Nice. And how did you find that? Like, I mean, I saw I saw some of Nick's music. I didn't I, I was researching Utah and I didn't come across the music stuff. So how do you find I'm super interested in like that renaissance energy? So you're sort of you gravitate, you know, in music, you're creating songs and lyrics and doing your poetry. How did that sort of strengthen you into becoming a screenwriter and author and stuff as well? Um, that's a really good question. I guess I just sort of followed slowly, but surely, I think as you grow into yourself, you start to follow your passions more mm -hmm. and trust yourself more. And the, uh, obviously I was writing content for TV um, and um, was also appearing in little films and things. But uh, I then developed this huge passion about uh, street art and could see its filmic potentials. And um, I decided that it had to be a screenplay. And in fact, I started writing it years ago, um, uh, much like my first novel, they both sort of gestated about, mm. how old is my daughter now, 24? Uh, they both gestated, you know, probably uh, 20 years a a ago at least. And over that period of time, they mm. metamorphosed and uh, my novel, my first novel only recently came out and the screenplay over time evolved. And I, I, I learned the craft as I wrote that screenplay. Um, and obviously moving on from writing for television, writing for the screen is very different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I bought a lot of books and I taught myself and I worked with a producer early on. And my husband was obviously having two writers at home is very, you know, really a great support. Cause I remember giving you the screenplay and you said, right, it needs this and that. And I went wow. back to the drawing board and did that. So I what think we're team. very lucky to have each other at that level although it has to be yeah. said he hasn't read my first novel <laughs> no. Slap on the wrist. Wrist. i haven't read your second book but <laughs> I find, no but you don't find that like <clears throat> even your loved ones and you know i have a twin brother as you know and like i would share my script with him and he, it's not it's not like a personal dig at me but he just he'll be like 
that's my twin. I'll come around to reading that when the time is right. So I think yeah. it's just, it sometimes happens, doesn't it? When you have a friend or a close one, you know, a loved one that has written something, you're like, I know it's going to be awesome. I'll get around to it. But switching gears, I find that super interesting talking about the difference in TV writing, screenwriting and going to film and really doing that, that passion project, which I know will be made. And uh, switching gears to you, Nick, as well. Um, I've been doing some amazing reading just here as we can see. So I've thank you for this as well. I've got to say, like, so diving into like the backstory for you as well, before we go into the book, I was blown away by being at your guy's house and the gallery with your dad's work as well. So tell me about, you talked to me a bit about that, but his influence on you with constructing such wonderful cosmic and, and fantasy novels, how did that all work back in the day? I think it's, uh, you're right, it's only now I'm realizing that he, he did have such an influence because you, you grow up with um, this unusual stuff in your background as, your, as a child and you think it's kind of normal, then you realize later on that it, it's unusual and it, it was quite a, a creative and bohemian household that I grew up in. Yeah. I, realized I was very fortunate to have that experience and uh, oh, I so, used to... Yeah work in it we, we had a sort of modern chapel tacked on the end of this huge old building that we lived in that had been built for the previous occupants which was um, a monastery as a monastery it was um, a, a wonderful exhibition space but also great for me to make music in because it had a full-size piano in there really so i used to work in i was surrounded by my dad's artwork on all the walls and it was really just a very large very resonant space um, and uh, had very fond memories of those times. And how did that, inf I'm so interested, how did that influence the sound of your music or some of the tenets of your music and the scapes? Did, uh, cause it's for people who haven't seen, you know, Nick's dad's art, it's like the best way to, I guess everyone has a different interpretation of art. It's the wonderful thing. But it, to me, it's like, it's very Fae-like, Tolkien-like, you know, um, and some people see it as, star being Pleiadian, you know, with these beautiful yeah. beings in these natural landscapes. So how did that work with your, your music um, as an inspiration? I think my father was a little disappointed because he used to make his own improvisational music on piano, really? which was quite meditative, and it went very well with his paintings. Um, he was always a little disappointed. Mine was a little bit more rock and roll, had a bit more of a rhythm to it. <laughs> He used to call it rumpty tumpty music because I think his generation couldn't quite understand the new gener generation's music. His, he, he kind of stopped at the ink spots and jazz. Yeah. And, um, I think the only record he ever bought that was even remotely contemporary was Beach Boys Good Vibrations. And, and that's about it. Right. It never went beyond that. Um, so, I, you know, being that much younger, I enjoyed material that was quite a lot more rhythmic. Nice. Um, no, that's that's cool. He accepted that and he was a very supportive father and he always tried to help me as best he could to, to make music and encouraged it. So that was good. Oh, we have such polar uh, childhoods. I was always the, the rugby jock family of three brothers and my dad was always like, none of you are ever going to be artists or actors. It's not right. your thing. There's there some, you know, he's such a wonderful supportive dad, but there was that sort of conditioning. Whereas yeah. you guys, you know, it's just the most incredible prowess of you know your lineage is in your blood as people would say so um, curiously, my father loved rugby and, and my <laughs> my grandfather used to play rugby and was quite successful and my father used to watch it at the end of his days but yeah i didn't get on i preferred soccer yeah, yeah I to be honest like we all you know i i always get stick from you know from dear my girlfriend for those listening who's you know come from that really spiritual um you know writing background as well actually kind of similar to you guys but i always get stick like how do you watch the ufc or rugby and i'll do it i guess it's the old the old stew the older aspect of me that yeah. i still have my vices i'm sure you'd relate to that nick but yeah, yeah. Uh, with tara as well like uh going to um it's it's gorilla so it's graffiti boy gorilla girl and is yeah it's yeah. graffiti boy heart gorilla girl Art. so it's it's the um the icons you know of the what is it forward and and three uh so um keeping it real um, it real. yeah i just i just wanted to say that uh, about uh nick's dad's work because i think yeah. it's such an amazing accolade is that tracy emin we had the good fortune of uh being in her company one day and she asked to see the website 
and she actually gave us a wonderful review for his work and she what was it she said she, she was surprisingly receptive to it because i always thought that uh, someone like tracy Emin wouldn't be interested in my father's work because his work is very different from her own um but she loves blake and i've always thought my father was a sort of latter-day william blake and she she picked mm -hmm. up on that immediately and so that was an interesting really oh fascinating i really yeah i mean i was saying to you guys i was like i am going to come back and make an offer you cannot refuse for whatever piece is is willing yeah. to be sold we just had our best sale actually we just sold a, a big painting to someone in america i now have the happy experience of packaging it up and shipping it but uh yeah amazing but yeah because it I just love, yeah, we could, we could do a whole podcast just on, you know, your father's work and even, you know, Tara's, you know, mother and everyone as well. And your Tara's yeah. father as well, who was newer on my radar as well. So going back to that as well, like, it's so cool how music, cause when I, let's go into the process. I'm such a nerd when it comes to screenwriting process. And I'm one of those people, which we're talking about music. I'll have a playlist for, it's almost like creating that temple space. You have that playlist that comes on. There'll be a theme that kind of dictates the scene, I guess, if you want to get more incremental. So how do you write, Tara, when it comes to screenwriting? Are you straight into, are you page to page or do you outline? You said it came from your your love and wonderment of graffiti art. Was that Banksy? How did that all work? I have a million questions. Funny enough, we were talking about the process of writing, Nick and I, just the other day. Yeah. Uh, um, and I definitely have... Uh, a, a load of music in my head for Graffiti Boy Heart Gorilla Girl because yep. I see it as that kind of uh, very um, uh, that the kind of film where where music really mm. plays an integral part of it. Like um, it can make such a difference, um, like Baby Driver. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it has that kind of musicality, yeah. yeah, driving dynamic. Yeah. yeah. So I think for no me, unintended <laughs> as as a as a writer. Um, I've always uh, kind of started at page one with a kind of, uh, you know, really ballsy kind of, I'm just going to jump in at the beginning and see where it goes. And That's and very Tara. It's very me. Yeah, yeah. I am. Uh, you're a bit of a Geronimo. You just jump out of the plane, even if you're not wearing the parachute. That's true. Oh, <laughs> just a maverick. <laughs> and I think about the parachute later, you know. Yeah. Uh, but then... Uh, Obviously, with a screenplay, you know, page 10, you've got to be hitting a point whereby there's the reveal where this story is going. And there are there are, there are plots, points along the way that you have to sure. adhere to. Yeah. And, uh, but much like the novel, uh, with my work, I find that sometimes the work informs me of where it's going. And I, I oftentimes feel that it is a divine divinely given gift and oftentimes we plug into something and you go with the flow and then yeah. there are days when you go i really don't know where this is going next and you have to stop and step yeah. out and do a few pages of notes and kind of get down to brass tacks but um yeah i like to fly by the seat of my pants until my pants catch on fire and i have to stop well said <laughs> That's great. And what about for you, Nick, as well, with how you did uh, your novels and everything? I'm just going to jump in because we are kind of like the, the what is it, the hare and the, the tortoise and the hare. You <laughs> know guess. who's the hare. <laughs> I know the hare, yeah. No, you're the tortoise. Tortoise, rather. <laughs> yes, I was getting mixed up. I was thinking of a hare that was really lazy, but okay. yes, the tortoise. All right, is yeah. Um, yeah, I, I started with music as Tara did, and uh, <clears throat> I was obsessed by music. And then I got bored with it after a while, and I had to do a job to make a living because that wasn't going to make me a living. Um, even well, I had some, sell. I had some success early with the BBC doing backing music and things like that. But nice, yeah. Uh, that you know sort of waned as time went on, and working with bands and so on, I got fed up with that. I think it's a phase a lot of people go through. And so I did some work as a property manager for a while, which was boring, but it did pay the bills. And then Gotta be done. Yeah. come back to writing. And I, I sort of turned a lot of my musical ideas or things I couldn't realize musically into ideas for um, books, really. But I see them very filmically in my head. So I, I see them very visually. And as I'm writing, I'm, I'm running the movie in my head. And I think a lot of writers write like that. Oh, yeah. And definitely your style as well. Like from how much I read, it's it's really interesting because it is, it's kind of like, 
um, you know, one of those things where, it, again, it's all about, you know, the holographic universe and going into the su supercomputer through your avatar consciousness, I guess, or projection. Yeah. And it's, <clears throat> I mean, for someone like me who nerds out on that stuff, I can just see exactly, it's really well descriptively written. So I'm already there for sure with yeah. the colors and the scale and everything. And I love the slang and the new sort of uh, the new words that are being created from, from Pi Lightfoot. And I loved that it was based in Hawaii. So how did that happen? Did we? Did you go on holiday there, or you just? I wish. Remembrance. Sorry, uh, I haven't been there sadly. Although I'd love to go <clears> one day. But I, I wanted my character. To, she she's mixed race. So her mother is Hawaiian. Her father is this um, eccentric English professor who she doesn't know because he died when she was young and um, very young. And uh, that that gives her. I think Hawaii does have that connection with with surfing and the sea and the ocean. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a huge feature. It's always there, always present. And the book is about a um, new kind of surfing because my character enc encounters a world where code, computer code, is is liquid and and oceans are made of it in this virtual domain, and you surf them to create new realities inside these giant <clears throat> pipelines of code. Um, you know, normally a pipeline might be 10, 20 feet high on a really large wave, and the waves might be 50 or 60 feet high, maybe 100 is the sort of maximum. She surfs waves that are tens of thousands of feet high in this virtual domain, and she surfs them at supersonic speeds because you can in the virtual domain, and you yeah. create create realities within that, that way. Yeah. Um, it's just she, that I love the idea of the dynamic sort of sense of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's wonderful. For anyone watching, like, should really go over and check it out on Amazon or whatever um, way they can find the book. And just for people yeah. who, who haven't this, heard. This, this is the first book. Uh, first but book. It's the, the second book, Seven Tsunamis, where the yeah. thing literally becomes a major feature of, of that book. Oh, I love the symbology, too. With like, you know, I was in Ireland, I was telling you, in the Celtic spiral and there's stuff in there. And even when, you know, because I'm doing a documentary, it's in post that was, you know, it's based on the aquatic beings the dolphins in hawaii yeah. and i was just i just there's a lot of tourisms because it's based in 2052 right is in the it is. So it's not a huge yeah. distance from where we are now it, it's yeah you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> years in the future yeah and, and to me you know this is where we could go down the rabbit hole but that yeah. that's we're not far away from that technology existing so this is why i think right. it's so powerful because People are already like seeing it, you know, from a, there's the negative timeline of the metaverse and the other side of, you know, consciousness transference technologies, which is like, it's like one of my things that I'm super interested in. And, you know, stuff like this is happening in Hawaii. There's loads of supernatural encounters, whether it be in the ocean or from, yeah. you know, from the, sure. you know, the actual yeah. energy there. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I loved it. And I love to use some of those those names, those words that are kind of sort of tribal sounding as well with some of her, was it her mother and other people that's, you know, in her family, I guess. But um, how, how long did that take? Cause you were talking about you being the tortoise. Like I honestly, I'm, I say this to day. I say this to everyone. I am in awe when people can write books, you know, even if they're uh, short I, books. Yeah, for me I mean, writing. Yeah. For me, writing scripts is so much more natural. I guess. This. I started, yeah. sorry, but I started this two house <laughs> house moves ago. So I've, I've moved house twice since I started. Wow. And got married once to, to Tara. <laughs> um, Hopefully never again. <laughs> uh, yeah, hope, no, never again. No, this yeah. is it. Um, so it, it does take a long time for someone like me. Yeah, I, am, I am the tortoise in this, definitely. And I was seeing as well, like even, you know, really nice selling point for people who love Stephen Fry and stuff. I saw he gave it a lovely wee review on the blurb and stuff as well. Yeah, so how, how did that come kind about? Of review and Julian Clary. Yeah. Julian Clary. Stephen's a lovely man. Yeah. He's, he's a remarkable man. Yeah. Brilliant. How, how has that worked with, you know, people always say, I'm apart from you guys, you know, I, I speak to, there's some people I collaborate with who are <clears throat> screenwriters who have to be like a real type for me. Do you guys have like a network, you know, like a screenwriting group or a, a writing book um, group in general where you bounce off ideas or are you more of a lone wolf just I working with each other? More of a lone sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, yes, uh, and Katara <laughs> did experiment with um, poetry groups and, and poetry <clears throat> groups, perhaps more than I have. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I think we're both fairly sort of much loners in, in that regard, but we do bounce ideas off each other and a few trusted friends. Yeah. So it's, it's always good to get feedback from people like yourself who understand. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love it. You, these worlds. I mean, we, we connected on, you know, films that we're very interested in, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, even though I'm just 31, I feel, I feel definitely from like the sixties and seventies with music, yeah. as you know, I love credence and that really dictates a lot of how I write things. Like I'm doing a, a film, as you know, based on a real story or inspired by a real story in the sixties. I just love that time period. And, yeah. you know, um, that's where I was interested in talking, I guess, about where we are now, like going from the sixties, seventies, even nineties, like me growing up, like going to Blockbuster, getting films and, you know, yeah. creatives and artists were really well looked after. And you've both been in the music industry too. And you see how hard it is, you know, with Spotify changing the game and all those things. So what do you feel switching back to you, Tara, <clears throat> with, I guess you could say advice just from your journey to anyone with <clears throat> getting a film actually made or getting the, the funding and going through the pitching process how have you found that with, because people might not know your scripts have won awards at Moondance and uh, the European Film Awards and all that stuff. So is it pushing a boulder up a hill? Yeah. It, it, it is uh, an upward push. And I think you need to re remember from the start, once you've got your finished product and you're pretty happy with it, yeah. that um, this can take 10, 20 years to come to fruition. You just have to know that unless you're incredibly lucky, that this is not going to be an overnight thing. And I suppose for me as a writer, I was really hoping to find a producer or a director to go the next leg of the way with me. But oftentimes, yeah. you know, in this world, you have to be the director, the producer, you the do. writer to get things off the ground. I can't say that's part of my toolkit. So what I did do, although I, <laughs> I did manage to get the screenplay to some really interesting people, but I wasn't able to get um, to get the money together. Uh, and so what I did do then was I just started to send the screenplay to a load of um, festivals and uh, competitions because I thought I've invested all this energy in this. Is it yeah. as good as I think it is? Yeah. Um, and you know, at the ver at the end of the day, can I at least get a, a get a hands up for the screenplay itself? So I sent it out uh, and to a load of different festivals, and um, it won the Moon Dance International Film Festival for screenplay, and it came second at the Real Heart International Film Festival. And we Toronto. went out to Toronto, and they nice. put on a, a sort of production of it with a bunch of young actors, which was beautiful to yeah, see it actually read. It was yeah. it was just a reading of it, but it was amazing, I and bet. then it. Um, won a couple of other uh, awards. So that was lovely for me. And it got me to a place where I felt good about the project. And now I'm just hoping that it, it will go the rest of the way. I, I find it kind of difficult to believe that a film celebrating street art, um, you know, cannot capture the imagination ultimately of the general population. Because I know that Two million pounds uh, was uh, garnered from Banksy's recent um, dismal land in yeah. Western Supermare. This is a money making thing. We know that a lot of people are investing in street art. So for me, um, I, I spent a lot of time and energy in a place called Stokes Croft in Bristol, where Banksy cut his teeth, um, hanging out with street artists and really getting mm -hmm. under the skin of what it it meant to be on the streets and creating this kind of art. And visually, I thought that the right art director would know how to create a film whereby these enormous canvases on these buildings, which are so beautiful, how those could be used dramatically to support the, the dramatic story itself. So literally, whether or not um, these beautiful canvases come to life in some kind of almost um, animated way or whether just um, as backdrops to the drama I I felt that I wanted to tell this story mm. alongside the artwork that it's amazing music uh, with the amazing music yeah. but I think also because mm -hmm. uh, um, it's 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 a, a drama it's a murder mystery it's a love story 
Um, but, and it's essentially for a young audience. It, yeah. but, but what's interesting about street art is it's kind of, it's about young men leaving their mark. It's like, you know, young yeah. boys pissing up against walls to leave their mark, to leave their identity. And when you look at what they do uh, to create this art with, uh, sometimes mm. they have to create incredibly long um, uh, heads on uh, fire extinguishers to create enough propulsion to get their art up onto the walls. They, you know, they jump buildings. They do incredibly dangerous things, hang off yeah. buildings. So for Rule me, this, sometimes this, lose their lives. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. for me, this was an action-packed, artistic, uh, male-dominated, ultimately world. And I think one of the things that Nick and I share with our work, and you can see that in his novels as well as in this film is that we wanted to get away from guns. We wanted to uh, find different ways of telling stories that wasn't just about bang, bang, you're dead. You know, yeah. in Nick's story- but without without losing excitement. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great challenge. It's a great challenge to have as a writer. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. I tip my hat and that makes it more original and about the the characters. It's more character driven essentially, right? But going, going yeah. into that, like, in a world where you see such profound art and people, there's definitely a demand for it. And of course, going back to the pitching to producers and, you know, they, they're always looking, a lot of them are looking just for stuff that's trending or, you know, stuff they can get green lit from whatever financial backers, but it's always hard. Like when you're doing such an original uh, piece, which we all like to think we strive for it, pitching that can be tremendously hard because, you know, especially yeah. something that's layered. Yeah. This was the thing with Graffiti Boy Heart Gorilla Girl because uh, the female character is a gorilla gardener. So she's an eco warrior. And I thought, right. well, this is a no brainer. You know, uh, all of the, uh, you know, producers and creatives are asking for projects that are eco led, you know, have great, strong female characters, etc. cetera. And uh, my lead character is Sikh. And, um, you know, how can this project not be ticking those boxes? So I think that it is very difficult to, um, you know, s sort of get work made these days, even when you meet those agendas. I mean, we just, I just wrote a um, TV pilot for my first novel with Colin, by the way, who writes for um, the BBC, Casualty. writes Casualty. And we just Standard wrote a female led um, a project. And obviously there's a lot of talk about, <laughs> You know, trying to give more a gravitas to female-led projects. But yeah, it was really interesting that even with a female-led project, we were still told, oh, yeah, you know, There's we love this. There's always a reason. There's, There's always, always some reason. But the, the yeah. other thing I wanted to touch on is the theodicy. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of dystopian um, uh, work that, you know, we're all seeing and watching on TV and Netflix. So Everything is so dystopian these days. And I really feel that we need to make a push so towards... Pessimistic. Yeah, yeah to yeah. through Tokyo. It's called the through Tokyo. And it's the kind of novel that offers mankind a positive outcome at the end of the day. And there are writers that are pushing for this kind of uh, these kind of books, these kind of the novels, outcome. these kind yeah. of films and TV projects to be made, because we're living in a world where we're pushing this negative ideology yeah. of dystopia, which I understand, God knows, you know, we're, we're all nervous about um, uh, a lot of what's going on. But unless we create, as creatives, a positive future for mankind, we're kind of writing ourselves out of a future. I do believe that our consciousness and our, thereby our projects creates our future. So yeah. I think we have a responsibility as writers and creatives to write positive narratives, to write through topias, not just dystopias, because we think that's what the public want. Uh, so yeah, I think that's well said. Uh, and I, I think, you know, to add to that, it's like Plato once said, I love Greek philosophy. He was like, those who tell the stories control societies. And it's, it really is like, it's so true. Like you, you flick on Amazon prime or Netflix and there's so many dystopian dramas, sci-fis, and you know, some of them, you know, can be a bit better, but it is essentially conditioning, you know, yeah. with what they're doing because people may, you know, may think it's woo woo, but like stories and films, music, books, they have so much power in constructing yeah. how we think and go ahead in our lives. And I think it's interesting going back to what you said about graffiti and, and everything as well, is that revolutionary energy, you know, which is very powerful right now when we see like the people 
you know, wanting answers for some atrocities at governmental level or whatnot. And, you know, arts can be such a powerful way to to show that, whether it's an environmental message <clears throat> or corruption as well. So does that filter into the the screenplay? I can't, look, can't wait to read it, but does that filter into it as well with the characters with putting this message out there to the world? Oh, very much so. Um, the female character, as I said, she's a, gr- a, um, a gorilla gardener. I don't know if you know what gorilla gardening is, but it's no, brilliant. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically eco warriors at a plant level. So what a gorilla gardeners do, and this mm-hmm. has been going on for many years, is they go out under the cover of night and they oftentimes create seed bombs, say, for example, in the shape of um, hand grenades, and they throw them into disused um, areas of the city where they, and in these mm-hmm. grenades, if you like, these sort of uh, handmade grenades, when the rain hits and they open and all the seeds come out. So they, and they also mm-hmm. go out and they plant up uh, uh, pieces of land, disused pieces of land or, you know, concrete mm-hmm. jungles that have been forgotten by society and they, they plant edible plants there, you know, so uh, the council, if they found them, would find them, but actually what they're doing is they're trying to create a greener, more beautiful world, so they're eco-warriors at they're this basic no level. Wow. Um, so productive as well and positive. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. really gorgeous and um but it, but it's not considered a positive action by the councils, which again, yeah. oh, it's health and safety probably but. gone mad. Yeah. And did you find that as well? Like when you were, you know, pitching it, I'm just interested because I'm in that process, as you know, with a couple of projects, TV and film, that like pitching it when it is very layered and much deeper, maybe character wise or even esoterically, it's really hard to, because usually you get like two minutes in a room with someone or. Yeah, like a Right. And pitching is just like you're trying to you're trying to sort of project what was in your mind, like the full story. And for me, like, you know, I find that interesting when you're doing stuff with that's so differently done and challenges the status quo of what's been programmed. You know, it has a huge challenge. But, you know, is it a project that you think you can do in an indie level still in like a nice maybe two to five million budget? Yeah, totally. Um, In fact, I worked with um, a young film company. And they said we could do it for under half a million, you know, like 350,000 pounds locally in Stokes wow. Cross with young street artists using their mm-hmm. art. We even um, uh, interviewed a load of young actors. They were awesome who read for the parts. And uh, one reason and another, you know, it didn't it didn't follow through. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I got the whole pitch down, as you must do, to one line, which is Spider-Man with spray cans, because, you know, they're hanging off buildings. and But you have to have that tagline to get mm-hmm. them interested. It's like I always think of Tarantino. You know, you're in the elevator with a producer, a director. You've got five minutes to pitch. Yeah, five what do you seconds. say? <laughs> five seconds. What do you say? And yeah. when it is multi-layered, as Graffiti Boy Heart Gorilla Girl is with the eco-warriors and, you know, the, the whole ethnic story line as well you know you wonder which bits do i should i bring out is you know should i say all of this is it too much information right. and um yeah. for example when i send you the package you know there are additional things that i like to include like images of street art that show you how this film could be made so that uh you really enjoy and get all these different levels out of the visual yeah. aspect of the street art so yeah. yeah, it is difficult, I think, not, you know, how excited do you get? But I think the Tarantino pitch, the reason why Tarantino, I think, works so well is because he gets so excited when he pitches. He you does. know, the guy's on fire, literally, you know, and I think you do have to try and project that excitement as much as possible. Yeah. And he, and Tarantino is a great, a great example of someone who's like very original, has such a unique, distinct voice. And I, even like how I was reading one of his scripts the other day and how he writes like the action is like, you know, with, I think it was Kill Bill and it was like, bang, and she pulls the fucking, they pull the fucking trigger and the, the bride is dead. And it's just like, so like provocative and out there, but you, it's like you said, his energy of him speaking it. Cause he's such an animated wild guy comes across on the page as well, which some people think could be overkill, but I love that. Just people who are really like taking dialogue to a new level. And it's very, it's very much like, um, I guess you could say multi-dimensional as well. Cause it's like going off in 10 different directions, uh, which he does well. And he reels it back in and sort of ties in suspense with it as well. Like we see with loads of his films, you know, in glorious bastards, right at the start of, uh, is it Colonel Landa having a cup of 
milk or something and you know what's going down it's crazy um what about you with you nick because we we've talked um so long when we were there just about some of our favorite films you know from apocalypse yeah. now to stanley yeah. kubrick and how do you feel like with talking about like the generational piece you see like the short attention spans the tiktokers doing their dances and stuff you know which is interesting for me and i'm only early yeah. 30s how do you find it with like we talked about Kubrick and how long he builds this world and sets up scenes? Do you think that's something that could come back into the mainstream? I guess. Yeah, I think it's it's reassuring that someone like uh, James Cameron can make these epic yeah. films, whether it's Titanic, which was a kind of remake anyway of a disaster for goodness sake, which everybody thought was going to sink as spectacularly as, as the original liner. Yeah, uh, ends up being the highest grossing movie of its time, and um, because he, he he knows how to pull out the the aspects that we all crave from uh, our movie experience, and he he you know doesn't shy away from um, using epic lengths to his films. And Avatar, which is very bold, again everybody thought, well, what what is this guy doing now? You know, this is this a cartoon? What is it? Yeah. So, again, he he pulled it out of the bag. Um, so it is reassuring that the audience still resonates with that sort of uh, epic theme, the epic movie. Yeah. Um, I think if what you're doing is good, it, it'll always work. It, it is true, though, that I, you know, I, I feel I'm a little out of touch now with the young generation and TikTok and so on. Me too. The world is full of pop groups I've never heard of. Um, that you know, our kids un understand, but we don't. I mean, it, we, we met Sophie Tucker a few years ago, and I didn't even know who they were. And they had to explain who they were. So, <laughs> so cool. You that's know, but that's great. me. So, I love that. I love that. But, you know, you, you try. Um, yeah. At the same time, I, I don't think you have to be fashionable. You don't have to be in tune with what, you think people want you have to just follow your intuition i think absolutely yeah um wise and yeah, i think you know I mean, jim cameron a great example like yeah. he wrote avatar as you know off based from a, a dream he had in the 80s you yeah. know like right this i guess you could say before he'd really blown up and he had that scene i think it was of um the avatar and the navi swimming through those waters and then obviously the yeah. bioluminescence which is amazing like <clears throat> taking like a scene from a from a dream and making this building this world which is just the phenomenal fifth element, the fifth element you know the movie yeah. it was all a dream as well by the I director i can't remember yeah. Yeah. yeah oh it's it's incredible and i love that because that's literally by definition going from your imagination, your intuition or subconscious, I guess you could say as well. And, you know, Jim Cameron is one of my heroes. I mean, I don't agree from, cause I've watched so many BTS behind the scenes of how he does it, but he is, even though he can be a bit of an auto, you know, a bit of a dictator and how he does it yeah. from my friends who have worked with him, he's still yeah. phenomenal. And he's just very passionate about his vision. And I mean, if yeah. we look at Chris Nolan, Kubrick and uh, Jim Cameron, they all created worlds, like whether it's, um, you know, sort of Chris Nolan with those IMAX cameras, Jim with 3D, right? And then obviously Stanley with building his sets. And the, yeah. they, they all come from like this engineering sort of state, I guess, if, if you will. So I think that's one of those things that the, the, the industry needs, because even though we have an abundance of choice with technology and stuff, it's kind of doing these golden handcuffs when it comes to writing isn't it it's like no you have to have a big action sequence you know depending on the genre at this yeah. place and people have these really sort of stringent rules whereas for me i see it like going back to what tara said it's all narrative driven and dystopian rather than like the internal you know external conflicts that a character has and sometimes they tie them in well together don't they but sometimes they just get you know thrown out there and they just blend into one like even with me, like I'd be interested to hear how you guys find with, you know, writing. Like people are like, I'm working with a producer. He's a great friend. He's very, he's a London lad and he's super direct. And he's like, Stu, you can't do a 150 page script. This is crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, I said to him, bro, what are the best films? And he gave me a list. It was like, I think his list was like Braveheart, Whiplash and The Matrix. And I'm like, they're all long films. Because yeah. people need to be, even though we have a ADHD sort of 
society, you know, everyone has aspects of it, I guess, on a scale, you know, yeah. how do you guys find, do you care about how long your book is or your script, or do you just do it as long as it takes? I think you just have to do it as long as it, as it takes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is something that I've come to late in life, which is that, um, you have to please yourself this, you yeah. know, you can't think about what is, uh in fashion at that particular point in time or you end up pleasing nobody in the end yeah you have to write the book you want to write make the film you want to make and i think yeah. all of the great successes in authorship in films uh, is where people have just gone bugger it i'm this is what i see this is and that's also when we watch films and if i see that a film is directed uh and written and produced by the same person, I know it's going to be one person's vision. And I usually turn to Nick mm. and I go, this should be good. When there are yeah. 16 yeah. screenwriters, that's yeah. usually a bad sign. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, we just watched this really clever series, very well done series called The Offer about the making of The Godfather, the original movie. Wow. And okay. It, it, it was a pretty mm. honest um, expose of the difference between what the studio thought that they should give the audience of what the <clears throat> producers and director really wanted the writers really wanted they they were trying to cut the edit down to the last minute uh, yeah. and you know they had to fight to, <clears throat> to make it the epic that it was and to get the people they wanted and look at all the awards it garnered at the end yeah, of the day so they 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 clung to their vision and and made it a reality against all the odds and it I don't know if you've seen that series yet, but it is. I can't um, wait to. I mean, you exercise. told me about it. Yeah, yeah, it's well worth seeing because it you it's it's quite unbelievable uh, the number of obstacles that were thrown in the producer's way. Absolutely, um, and it, we were talking about the heart of darkness, which again is uh, it's, uh, yeah. Francis Coppola's wife. He did a wonderful job filming the whole ordeal of getting yeah. that that bad boy made, and them yeah. remortgaging their house and putting everything on the line. And I resonate, we were talking about these documentaries are great for filmmakers to watch because you see the brass tacks of what it takes. And also like what Tara was talking about, you know, the creative vision, that's what keeps me up at night. I'm pretty chill. But when it comes to a passion, a project, which I guess we're, us three are quite similar. We don't do as such like jobbing, uh, right. You know, writing jobs. We don't really option stuff. You know, I really like, you know, like Tara said, I want to be the writer, producer, director, director will come, you know, it takes years yeah. maybe to, to mold yourself into that. And of course the stress that comes with it. So yeah, I find, I relate to that. Like when I take it, when I'm interviewing directors or producers, you've got to know that they're in for the vision because how many times have we seen films totally the original script? is just miles away from what they actually end up filming and then obviously doing in post or editing. So how do you find that as well? Like for you, Tara, with going back to, you know, uh, Graffiti Boy um, loves Gorilla, Gorilla Girl. How do you find finding that director and them giving, giving that trust to them as well? Um, my dad always used to say writing is rewriting. And as a writer, I'm not afraid of rewriting. I think you have to be, as my father said, willing to kill your darlings. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's the right thing to do, you know, obviously a film is oftentimes um, uh, a group project. Um, but hopefully, as you say, you all have a similar vision uh, yeah. in mind so that, you know, those edits are with that vision in mind. Um, but, you know, uh, as a novelist, as a poet, as a screenwriter, um, writing is rewriting uh, right. to get to that at that end goal. But I think having that great unified vision is really important for the people involved. Absolutely. That's, that does come across well in, in the author <clears throat> series. You, you do get a sense that the producer and the director are both on the same page, which is vital. Um, and there's that old saying in in the movie world of um you know it takes 20 years to be an overnight success yeah and, you know it's it's, it's a tough hustle. Slog. people have to follow their vision I, I think that's so wise as well to say like for people watching this it's like really the best advice i'm sure we all agree on is just like don't rely on anyone like it sounds really nihilistic but it's it is a collaborative art but you know for at least for the pitching and the writing it's you and the page you got to finishing that as well. It's like honoring those incremental steps. It took me a while to realize, oh my God, finish the first draft. That's 
that's it. You should pat yourself on the back and be really yeah. joyous. And then you have to take it like Tara said, you're becoming a producer, a pitcher, then potentially director all in one, you know, for a time being. And then you can hand it off as people show their loyalty to the projects and if they really resonate with the the narrative and the vision. But it's really hard, you know, going into you know that journey because you get a lot of knockbacks. And it brings me to our next point. How do you talk about rewrites? How do you discern what is a good note and what is a bad one? Not about each other, because I'm sure you give each other great notes because it's very honest and you have a similar yeah. sort of ideology. I had, actually, I sent my um, screenplay to uh, an old friend of mine who has actually mm -hmm. just had a series made. And um, I remember getting her notes back on my screenplay and I didn't agree with them. And I, I think that, you know, sometimes you, you have to know what you're doing and, and believe in what you're doing. Um, uh, I'm not afraid of notes. Uh, I'm happy to write, rewrite. Graffiti Boy Heart Gorilla Girl was a completely different screenplay. Uh, when I started it, it has morphed and evolved so many times and it's stronger for that. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to be able to put that idea up and be able to rattle and shake it and it still holds true. So, you know, you have to get mm. to that point where, yeah, you can chuck it around and people have looked at it. and But, you know, you have to feel, I think, in your gut that that's the story you want to write. And thank you for that. But that doesn't resonate for me. Yeah, I had an interesting experience with that because I ran my book manuscripts past um, professional editors and yeah. one of them suggested I take out this chapter. They said it slowed it down. It wasn't necessary. And I've had numerous, and I didn't agree and I kept chapter in there and I've had numerous people just come back to me and say, oh, I really like that chapter. I just out of the blue. And it's always, you know, it, you have to follow your own instinct. Definitely. You can take yeah. that um, advice or feedback, but you don't have to follow it if it doesn't feel right. Yeah. And especially, you know, knowing you guys, you know, I, I definitely know you're on a different level, like, and not to look down on anyone, but you are very special beings and, and creators. So it's like when you're bringing in, and what my point being is like, when you're bringing in like very different sort of uh, layered narratives, you know, and I'll get this when I read the script, but I can definitely, you know, see this from both of you. It's like what we're saying with pitching it to people who are come from very different backgrounds. It's like, I have my wonderful producing partner who is a phenomenal drama guy, but I do a lot of esoteric, supernatural sort of base inspired by real stories. So when you're getting into that more of that woo woo realm of, you know, I write a lot about the eternal Christic blueprint within, in this case, a native American tribe and this girl who's really suffering, you know, it's, it is hard to convey that they're like, cause they'll come back and be like, I like these scenes dwelling on the Catholic church and the abuse and that, that story. But I'm like, but it's not, it's not a spotlight film, you know, like that just does that. It's yeah. that's one aspect of it. It's a layer. Yeah. And I think that's really hard, isn't it? But it helps with the note taking. You can be like, Oh, I, cause I know them as a person. That's where that, you know, that's their lens, if you will. But it's, yeah. um, it's super interesting. I, I absolutely love it. And I, I can't wait to read your scripts and, and that brings me, you know, we're coming up to like an hour, but I just wanted to say it's where we are in this time. You know, we haven't got onto the topic of, especially you guys being uh, musicians as well from a music musical background. It is interesting how, you know, a lot of the technocrats, the huge corporations are the, are the kind of the gatekeepers now, like uh, Spotify for music. And then obviously Amazon Prime and Netflix, which are like huge disruptors in film. And, you know, I have my strong set opinions. Like I love going to the cinema and I want people to not see it as a block, you know, when say if someone's renting a film, some of the best films you'll see on Amazon, you've got to pay three pound 54 or whatever, if it's apocalypse now or whatever. And, um, you know, I think people shouldn't see that as a barrier because if the raw, the raw reality is filmmakers say, once we get this, you know, we get these amazing films made, which is a monumental effort. You're getting five to 10 cents per stream if it's on Amazon Prime and yeah. potentially Netflix. So I think where we are segueing into, you know, the more, I guess Nick will be great for this with the future timelines. We're in this sort of get coming into this sort of uh, internet of things age where the blockchain, which is something is more my specialty. I love talking about how it impacts films. We're seeing Francis Coppola's 
whole family, and Sophia is there as well, you know, creating decentralized pictures so the audience choose, they vote for which scripts they think should be made. So how do you think that's going to, the audience becoming the studio execs, do you think that's something you would get behind or would you think it's complicated? Well, I think mm -hmm. looking a little bit further into the future that software and computers will become so sophisticated and so powerful for um, home <clears> budgets, <throat> if you like, that um, you, you, there will be a total democratization of, of movie making the same way there have, has been with publishing and uh, music making. You can now do that on your laptop, but it's very yeah. difficult to make a quality movie <clears throat> cheaply because it is a very expensive medium to work in even today. Um, but I think that will change and I think uh, technology will advance the stage where you will be able to turn a script into a, at least a, a living um, storyboard, for one of the, you know, yeah. in other words, where animated characters that look photo real in photo real um, environments using real voices will bring your, your words to life. And uh, I can see a time when people will pay a license fee to use the words and, and images of, of famous actors. Um, as they, they already are, but that, that'll be something. So one day I think movie making will become very much more um, something that anybody can do at a reasonable cost. It would be great to get rid of these gatekeepers yeah. who have a limited idea of what we need and want, you know, to be fed an endless uh, potage mm -hmm. of uh, murder, yeah. murders and rapes and pillages and deaths and, you know, yeah, every it's just time. Yeah, sort of homogenous. Um, this, this, feeds into the, this feeds into the yeah. human brain. You know, you the cannot psyche, unsee yeah. what we see. We yeah. have to understand that those images stay in our mm -hmm. mind and, and feed our emotional state. You know, yeah. I think it's very dangerous and they hold a lot of power. And I don't think we should underestimate um, uh, the control that they have um, over the industry. So I would seriously welcome um, a, a narrative where we could control our stories and our storylines. And I think what hopefully has to happen, has to click, is that humanity realizes that we have the power. You know, it's only 1% of, of these people in control, but humanity seems um, still to believe that we're powerless. So yeah. hopefully in the time to come, people will step into their power and realize that we are divine beings with all the power. And, uh, you know... Which is why we discussed this the other day. I think people are so obsessed with superhero movies yeah. because they innately... Understand. resonate with that sense that actually they could be so much more we could be. we yeah. are yeah i've and thought about that all, yeah, yeah i thought about that even you know as a child i was just like this yeah. is really interesting how people are so connected to this and you know yeah. even as a child i felt very connected to like spider-man which we talked about earlier but it's true it's like but they've taken it so far i mean the symbology and the underlying tones and you know, subliminal stuff in like the Avengers films is wild. Like we're talking like stuff that's linked to coronavirus and all that. We could go down the rabbit hole, but it's there from like 2012, you know, oh, in yeah. the Captain America film. Oh yeah. So it's yeah. very weird. And it's, it, it all comes back to that. What Tara said is a monopolistic <clears throat> part of this, which yeah. is very algorithmic as well, because I know for a fact, Warner brothers, I have a friend who, who was in there or connected to them, even from a music perspective with playlists, there is an algorithm that types in Dwayne Johnson plus this script equals X amount in the box office or whatever. And that's something that like is killing art, you know, because it's just the only thing that's really getting pushed in cinemas is, is the massive films like Marvel, DC. And I speak to, you know, younger generations and their first question to me as a filmmaker is, are you DCU or MCU? And I'm like, neither. <laughs> yeah. I like, and I, I try not to like be pretentious about it, but it's just, something i do feel will break away and i think the irony here is the blockchain which is tech not obviously very ai tech based does could it given the fact that it's implemented well it can allow we the people to vote on what narratives and stories we want to see as opposed to like you said you know the real negative vibration negative energy ones which definitely do 
it impacts your sleep, your dream state, just your your emotional body as well. So I From think this, yeah. it very, I mean, there's a reason why. I mean, we could talk about this all day, but like, I mean, it's yeah. kind of my fascination. I, I I know it is for you guys too with understanding like how Disney was created, where did they come from, what agencies were they tied to, and they understood this back in the 40s, you know, even earlier, like we saw in you know, Nazi Germany with their propaganda films, which has been going on for ages, just in different mediums. Storytelling is the, <clears throat> of the oldest and most profound and most powerful of human uh, abilities. And, mythology. And, yeah, <clears throat> and, and mythology and, you know, exactly. around the old campfire of thousands of years ago, uh, our forebears um, had the same experience with their stories that we have now. And things haven't changed that much. It's it, I think the audience deserves the very best stories we can tell, and it, it always pays. We all have a, a great nemesis. We all have a great baddie, you know, yeah. a pretty dramatic story that requires that element, and, and they don't all require it. Um, it benefits from it being um, well depicted and, and um, well drawn, and uh, at the same time, that, that it, it does feel right that there should be more positivity i think and, yeah oh well it's good to end a, moralist, yes. a moralistic um pe- pro, you know um optimistic rather than pessimistic outlook absolutely and i, not, I think not that sort of indulgent um negative uh dabbling in the occult that goes on so many times uh, which is quite disturbing yeah. i think in a lot of they, they approach it from you know i've had a friend a friend who's obsessed with writing horror films and you know i, I i'm interested in his mind space uh, yeah. my suspicions but it's always like his in his mind it's like the bigger the better the more gruesome the better because it's like original yeah. or very you know stays with people and i'm just like oh it's a that's a that's a very sort of slippery slope for, yeah. for people to watch, yeah. you know but you know i understand you know showing that exposing the dark for what they are i take that that's like part of my mission on earth is to, to shine a light on it, but it also needs to be transmuted with pacing, like with showing the wonders of nature or whatever the narrative, it, the character's world is. You're showing that that light, that potential and hope rather than just old doom and gloom because some films do that. But um, anyway, guys, I, I love talking to you both. What was the best, uh, what's the best way for people to find you or to check out your work? Sorry, we Nathan. both have websites. Um, <clears throat> I've got one, nickgillador.com. Gillador is my middle name and uh, my writing name, G-I-L-I-D-O-R, uh, A-D-O-R, can't even spell my own name. Um, <laughs> take two. Um, I'll, put it, I'll put it on the description as well, so people have both your websites. Yeah. And Tara, what's yours as Tara. well? Uh, tararkle.com. Tararkle.com. Yeah. Got two A's in the middle, it's very confusing. But my, thank you. And my father's website's williamarkle.com. Oh, people should definitely check that out. I think um, a challenge to us, if you're open to it one day, is thinking about how we could create a film from one of your dad's um, paintings. I think that yeah. would be. I had that when I was in uh, Naples. Um, sorry, not Naples. When I was, you know, in Italy recently, I was in Florence. Sorry, and I was looking at Da Vinci's paintings, and I was like, to my writing partner who was there, I was like, we need to. This would probably be right up your street, Tara. Create a a film from this one masterpiece. I think that would be really interesting. But yeah. anyway, thank you for watching everyone. You know, feel free to share this, subscribe. And I'm sure you got some amazing wisdom from these two amazing um, authors and writers and musicians, all the above. So thank you guys. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you.